Hello again. We left off yesterday talking about uh, spiritual giftedness, and particularly Paul was talking about his gift to reveal the mystery of God, uh, which is the gospel. In fact, uh, in verse three of chapter three, uh, chapter three of Ephesians, it says, "The mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already briefly written." So it's interesting. This word mystery, mysterion, in the Greek literally means something that's hidden or veiled or are not recognized, but has now been unfolded. It's, it's confided in those who are the, in the inner circle and uh, not simply to ordinary mortals, but revealed to an in-group, a, a restricted constituency, the lexicon reads. And so what he's saying to us is that when we heard the gospel and we understood the gospel, that wasn't simply our comprehension, it was rather God's revelation. In fact, it's the idea of what we'll look at another word called apocalypto, where it means literally the curtain being pulled back. And suddenly we could see what we could not see before. So the capacity to, to understand God is something that comes through God's opening of the eyes and the understanding. Which leads me to really a, a, another question is, how, in the, how does God actually reveal himself to us? How does he make himself known? And scripturally, we find there are three things that God, uh, three ways in which God says he reveals himself. The first we would call natural revelation. The second I'd call biblical revelation. And the third one I would call divine revelation. And in a sense, we might say that all of them, if we see God in them, is, is divinely done. But the last one is particular in its uniqueness. And we'll probably only get to that tomorrow. But first of all, what is natural revelation? Well, one of my favorite passages uh, regarding that is found in Psalm 19, verse 1, where David says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the works of his hands. You see, one of the most uh, non-intuitive things, counterintuitive things, I think, in the world is the uh, theology behind evolution. And I use that term theology because evolution is not based upon any kind of factual discovery. I mean, there's no single thing that they can point to and say, here's absolute proof of evolution. In fact, oftentimes when you press people to explain why they believe in evolution, uh, they never can answer the most important question, and that is the question of origin. Where did it all come from? We know about the Big Bang Theory, which had been popular for probably about three or four decades. I'm not so sure it's so popular anymore because it's full of all sorts of problems. But the idea is that, first of all, we've never seen anything created with an explosion, a big bang. It's always destructive. And secondly, you have to even go back further and say, where did the combustibles come from? And where did the matter that blew up where was that created from? And, and where were supposedly the gases and who lit the fuse ultimately that set all of that off? There always has to be an origin and that's the problem. But you see, this has only come in the modern era where we begin to understand or discover scientific uh, things about the world around us, both in the micro universe, we've discovered that there's minutia that we can't even see with the naked eye. And there's also the macro universe, things out in the heavens that are beyond our comprehension. Earlier men had no illusions that, that somehow man had self-created or matter had self-created itself. And so they concluded that there had to be a greater force, a greater power. There had to be a God somewhere who was the author of all of these things. And it's interesting because if we talk about things like polytheism, the belief in many gods, uh, as far as back we go, the multiplication of gods is something that developed over time. As, and when we go further back in ancient history, we find that people simply believed that there was a divine being. There was a simplicity to it, and it's only as they began to try to explain all sorts of different phenomenon that they saw in the world that they began to give deity or identification with various objects as being divine and having the power unto themselves. Even in places like India today, where they have purportedly three million gods, basically uh, they refer them as, to, as being demons. In other words, they're not really the almighty god, they're a less 
lesser being. And that's really what they're, they're all uh, talking about, multiple lesser beings, which I think are demonic spirits. But one, one thing that's very obvious to people is it's very hard, and the reason why creative design is coming more into vogue, even in the secular community, is you can't help but look at the majesty and the mystery and the complexity of, of the universe and say the probability that this could have self-created is beyond the realm of possibility. In other words, it's, it's, there's so many things, so many multiples of multiples upon multiples of things that would have to come together to create the simplest cell, which we now know is not simple at all. Uh, it's more complex. The simple cell is more complex than all the infrastructure of the city of New York. Uh, the simple cell would have to have so many things working in conjunction in order for it to have any viability at all, much less to live and to grow and multiply. That it really realms in, it touches on the realm of total, absolute impossibility. And that's why when we say, well, then why do people keep on believing in something in evolution? It's because, as Paul said in Romans 1, because they did not want to retain the knowledge of God. They don't want to acknowledge the presence of God. As one uh, uh, physicist, uh, biological uh, uh, biologist said uh, from Princeton University, he said, it's not that I uh, don't think there could be a God. I just don't want to live in a world where there is one. In other words, he wants to be free from the morality and the consequences, the judgment that comes if there is a God. If there is a God and he created us, that means we are connected and we are accountable. And many people just don't want to live in a world where that's true. But here again, you can't go out on a starry night and look at the universe around us, even with the naked eye, without concluding that there's the glory of God. I mean, it's one of those kind of things, if, if the sun was any closer, it would fry us. If it was any further away, we would freeze to death. And that orchestra is, uh, is just so amazing and so inexplicable that you have to realize there has to be an intelligent designer. So to deny that there is a God is uh, probably the most uh, direct, abject form of uh, self-delusion that you can possibly imagine. And that's what it is. I don't want there to be a God, so I'm not going to believe that there is a God. I want to feel like I have free moral choice. I remember one time when I was in, uh, witnessing to a young man in Russia, and he was telling me that Yuri Gagarin, who was the first man in space, a Russian cosmonaut, that he uh, looked out the window of his capsule and he didn't see God in heaven. And I said to the young man, yes, but if he would stepped out of that capsule, he would have seen God immediately. And that's my message to people who say there's no God. There will come a day where you'll step out of this capsule, this world, out of this body, and you'll be in the presence of the living God. And then denial will not even be a question mark. You will see, obviously, it will be undeniable. The question you have to answer is, what side of eternity are you going to end up? Are you going to stand before the God of the universe and say, you don't exist? And he says, you do, and you will for eternity in hell. Or you're going to say, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. This is really the, the mystery that's revealed to us through just the natural universe that we're a part of. So I'm going to pick this up tomorrow as we're getting a little bit long here. And I want to talk about the second form in which or manner in which God reveals himself. And that's the issue of biblical revelation. So look forward to continuing this conversation. Stay tuned. I'll be with you. Bye.